desire to conquer the skies has been a dream of humanity for centuries. From the earliest recorded history, inventors and visionaries have sought to build machines that could defy gravity and take flight. In today's video, we're going to embark on a journey through time to explore the top 15 first flying machines that paved the way for modern aviation. Number 15. The Curtis Goopy Duck the Mighty Ducks, one of the greatest peewee hockey teams in sports history, but there's one Mighty Duck that often goes unnoticed, the Curtis Goopy Duck. This was a unique and unconventional amphibious aircraft that emerged during the early 20th century. Developed by French engineer Alfred Goopy in collaboration with the Curtis Aeroplane and Motor Company, the Duck very clearly represented a significant departure from traditional aircraft designs of the time. With its distinctive bird-like appearance and impressive capability, the duck garnered attention and admiration within the budding aviation community. Its most prominent feature was the duck-like configuration, which included a biplane wing setup with the upper wing positioned significantly forward compared to the lower wing. This configuration provided excellent stability and control during both flight and water operations. The aircraft's wingspan was relatively short, enabling it to operate in confined spaces such as rivers, lakes, or coastal areas. And it was designed as a versatile and adaptable craft capable of performing a variety of missions. That amphibious nature allowed it to take off and land on both land and water. It featured retractable landing gear, a watertight hull, and a hydrodynamic design made for smooth landings and takeoffs on the water. It was equipped with a powerful engine and semi-spacious cabin. The duck had an impressive carrying capacity, too. It was designed for search and rescue missions, reconnaissance, and aerial photography. That versatility made it a popular in both civilian and military roles, with several countries adopting it for their air forces. Now, despite its unique design and capabilities, the duck was eventually overshadowed by more advanced and more practical aircraft as aviation technology progressed. The duck's unconventional appearance make for more of a fascinating story, if anything else, and it serves as a goofy-looking reminder that in the quest to make the perfect aviation omelette, you gotta break a few eggs, even if those eggs came from the Curtis Goopy Duck. Number 14. The Row 1 Triplane The Row 1 Triplane. This takes us back to a time when the only limit to aviation was your imagination. It was concocted by the eccentric mind of Elliot Verdon Rowe. This peculiar-looking aircraft stands out like a sore thumb thanks to its three-tiered wings stacked on top of each other like a flying layer cake. This triplane took to the skies in 1909, capturing the imaginations of onlookers with its unconventional design. The three wings were connected by a series of struts and decreased in size from bottom to top, as if it were a stairway to heaven. The triplane configuration wasn't just for show, either. It served a purpose. The Row 1 triplane's stacked wings provided increased lift and stability, allowing for better maneuverability and control during flight. That innovative design was a testament to Row's forward-thinking approach to aviation. As this triplane gracefully soared through the air, and at least by 1909 standards, it brought people in from far and wide to catch a glimpse of the three-tiered invention, sparking curiosity and admiration. As time went on, though, it should come as no surprise that the triplane didn't exactly quite catch on. So, although the Row 1 triplane was not long-lived, its impact on aviation history cannot be overlooked. It did pave the way for future developments in triplane aircraft, most notably the iconic Sopwith triplane, which would later play a significant role in World War I thanks to its sleeker design and superior speed. The Row 1 triplane it remains a testament to the adventurous spirit of early aviation pioneers, back when things were a little more fun and people just wanted to try something we'd never seen before. Perhaps it should remind us all that sometimes imagination, creativity, and a little bit of elbow grease are more important. Number 13. Focke Wolf Triebflügel Looking like it blasted itself straight out of a video game, the Focke Wolf Triebflügel is a unique and awe-inspiring aircraft, and it's downright odd. Designed in 1944, it comes from a time when the Germans would have done just about anything to come out on top of the rest of the world. Created by the focke Wolf Company during the closing stages of World War II, this vertical takeoff and landing aircraft was like no other aircraft of its time. The Triebflügel's most striking and obvious is a one-of-a-kind design, which consisted of a fuselage with three massive rotor-driven wings mounted on vertical axes. The aircraft's name itself translates to thrust wing in German, reflecting that unique propulsion system. 
The concept behind it was to enable rapid vertical takeoff and landing, providing excellent maneuverability in confined spaces. Once airborne, the aircraft's rotors would be powered by a turbojet engine, propelling it forward at impressive speed. The vision of this thing was nothing short of awesome. It promised vertical flight capabilities that would revolutionize aerial combat and transportation. However, the aircraft's development was hindered by the chaotic circumstances of the final stages of the war, and only prototypes were ever constructed. And thank God for that, the aircraft underwent minimal testing, leaving many technical issues unresolved. Insufficient flight testing meant that critical performance and stability issues weren't adequately addressed, with the biggest problem being stability and control. Flying this thing would mean pilots had to manage the rotation of three separate wing-mounted rotors while maintaining stability. This added an extra layer of complexity to the aircraft's operation and increased the risk of pilot error, which would result in death at every turn. Plus, the single jet engine would have to power all three rotor-driven wings and limited fuel capacity and short flight duration would hinder its effectiveness in combat. Simply put, the thrust wing may have looked cool, but it wasn't realistic, not by a long shot. Number 12. The Christmas Bullet The worst Christmas gift of all time, the Christmas Bullet, holds a special place in aviation history for all the wrong reasons. The aircraft attempted to take to the skies in the early 20th century, but not even Santa Claus himself could have gotten this thing to truly take off. Designed and built by William Whitney Christmas, this monoplane made its debut in 1917 and quickly gained attention for its impressive speed and design. The Christmas Bullet was characterized by its sleek and streamlined appearance. Its elegant monoplane design featured a single wing without external struts or wires, which would minimize drag, enhancing aerodynamic efficiency. The aircraft's construction employed lightweight materials, too, and advanced engineering techniques contributing to that performance. But the remarkable performance was short-lived, to say the least. One of the key factors behind the Christmas Bullet's initial success was its revolutionary engine design. Christmas developed a radial engine to power the craft. That engine features cylinders arranged in a circular pattern around the crankshaft. But when the only good thing about an early flyer is the engine, you got a problem. But with that said, the bullet did live up to its name. In 1921, it set a speed record, reaching an impressive 124 miles an hour, making it one of the fastest aircraft of its time. This feat garnered widespread attention and solidified the Christmas Bullet's reputation as a high-performance craft. Despite those notable achievements, the Christmas Bullet faced challenges that limited its long-term success. The aircraft's commercial viability was hindered by factors like limited resources, competition from other manufacturers, and the evolving technology landscape of aviation. Additionally, like many experimental aircraft, it may have encountered issues that impacted its overall performance and reliability. Nothing that went into the aircraft was considered aircraft grade, and the wings would eventually warp, twist, and tear off from the craft. But that apparently wouldn't stop Mr. Christmas. He went ahead with a second prototype, which made it far enough off the ground that the ensuing crash would kill the test pilot. Number 11. Chanute Herring Glider there's flying, and then there's falling with style. This early flying machine allowed the pilot to do the latter, sort of. The Chanute Herring Glider is a collaborative effort between high-octane Octave Chanute and Augustus Herring. It represents a significant milestone in the history of aviation. Developed in the late 19th century, this glider played a crucial role in advancing aeronautical knowledge and paving the way for powered flight. This glider was designed based on the principles of stability and control. It featured a biplane configuration with multiple wings and a truss structure, which provided stability. Taking a big note from Mother Nature, the glider's wings had a curved shape resembling the wings of birds to generate lift and support the aircraft. Augustus Herring, a skilled aviator and aeronautical engineer, contributed his expertise to the glider's design, and flight testing saw some nasty falls before finally getting things off the ground. High-flying Herring made significant modifications to the glider, improving the control characteristics to get things just right and safe enough for flight. He also played a vital role in piloting the glider and conducting numerous test flights to gather valuable data and insights, because you really can't send someone to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. The glider's flight trials took place in the early 1890s, and it involved a series of progressive experiments. It demonstrated impressive stability and control, surpassing previous attempts in the field of aviation. These successful flights contributed to the understanding of aerodynamics, flight dynamics, and the principles of lift and drag. Plus, they played a crucial role in influencing and inspiring the Wright brothers' journey towards powered flight. 
The Wright brothers extensively studied Chanute's research and incorporated the principles they learned into their own aircraft designs. While the Chanute Herring glider was a significant achievement in its own right, it didn't possess the capability for sustained, powered flight. So when engines finally took to the skies, gliders like this one were phased out almost overnight. But if you can't run without walking, then you can't fly without gliding. Number 10, the Vought V173, or the Flying Pancake. Hot off the griddle, the Vought V-173, nicknamed the Flying Pancake, was a strange little craft that defied conventional aircraft design. It was developed by the Vought Sikorsky Aircraft Division of United Aircraft Corporation during World War II. The Flying Pancake was a proof-of-concept aircraft that pushed the boundaries of engineering. The V-173 earned its moniker due to its flat, dish-shaped airframe resembling a flying flapjack. This unique design was driven by the goal of maximizing lift and reducing drag. The aircraft featured a large circular wing surface with a central cockpit nestled within it. It also had small winglets at the end of each wing to improve stability. The only question is, did it all work? Well, the Flying Pancake's design offered several advantages. The flat, circular wing provided excellent lift characteristics and low stall speeds, making it suitable for short takeoffs and landings. The aircraft's compact size and lack of conventional tail section allowed for exceptional maneuverability, enabling it to perform tight turns and fly at slow speeds. The V-173's maiden flight took place in 1942, and it exhibited a level of stability and control that one can only hope for something with this shape. It did live up to the impressive expectations of slow flight capability, with a stall speed of around 25 miles an hour. The design also minimized the adverse effects of turbulence, making for a smoother voyage, too. Although the V-173 never entered active service, it played a critical role in the development of the Vought XF-5U Flying Flapjack, a larger, more advanced version of the Flying Pancake. The knowledge gained from the 173's test flights informed the design and development team for the XF-5U, which aimed to be a high-performance carrier-based craft. Unfortunately, the XF-5U didn't progress beyond the prototype stage. The Flying Pancake, though, remains an iconic symbol of aviation aircraft design. Its unconventional shape and remarkable flight characteristics, it challenged traditional notions of what an aircraft should look like. While its practical applications were limited, the Flying Pancake's contributions to aeronautical knowledge and its place in aviation history are undeniable. Number 9. Hiller VZ-1 Pawnee The Hiller VZ-1 Pawnee, also known as the Flying Jeep, was an experimental aircraft developed by the Hiller Aircraft Company in the 1950s. This revolutionary flying platform aimed to provide vertical takeoff and landing capabilities, offering a new level of mobility and versatility. The Pawnee featured a compact design with a central cockpit pod mounted on a single rotor at the top. It utilized tip jets, which were small jet engines located at the rotor blade tips to provide the necessary lift and thrust for vertical flight. The pilot controlled the craft using a simple control system, similar to a helicopter but without the need for a cyclic or collective controls. One of the key advantages of the Pawnee was its ability to operate in confined spaces. That small size and vertical takeoff capability allowed it to be used in various environments, including forests, urban areas, and small landing zones. The aircraft could hover, land, and take off vertically, eliminating the need for a runway and enabling access to remote or otherwise inaccessible locations. And during its development and testing phase, the VZ-1 Pawnee demonstrated impressive stability. It showcased the potential for a new type of craft that could perform tasks such as reconnaissance, observation, and transportation with ease. However, despite its promising features, the Pawnee faced several challenges that prevented it from becoming a widely adopted craft. Its tipjet propulsion system was noisy, inefficient, and required significant amount of fuel. It also had a limited payload capacity and range, making it a bit impractical for many military and commercial applications. Not to mention, a well-placed bullet would send both the pilot and the craft to the ground. While the Pawnee itself didn't achieve widespread success or long-term operational use, it does remain a fascinating aircraft that pushed the boundaries of traditional design, and it opened up new possibilities for vertical takeoff and landing capabilities, especially when you look at something like a hydro hoverboard. Number 8. Gossamer Albatross there are different types of power. Now, when it comes to aircraft, there's jet power, solar power, and wind power. But what about people power? Well, the Gossamer Albatross holds an interesting spot in the annals of aviation history as a human-powered aircraft and a milestone achievement. 
designed by Dr. Paul McCready and his team of flyboys. This lightweight and innovative aircraft completed a historic flight across the English Channel in 1979, showcasing the potential of human-powered flight. It featured a unique design that focused on maximizing efficiency and minimizing weight. It had a wingspan of over 94 feet, and it was constructed primarily of lightweight materials such as carbon fiber and mylar. The aircraft's wings had a unique double diamond shape designed to optimize lift and reduce drag. And as stated earlier, the Gossamer Albatross was powered solely by human energy, with a single pilot pedaling a bicycle-like mechanism connected to a chain-driven propeller. This innovative propulsion system allowed the pilot to convert their pedaling energy into forward thrust, propelling the craft through the air. On June 12, 1979, the Gossamer Albatross achieved a significant feat by crossing the English Channel from Folkestone, England, over to France. The flight covered a distance of approximately 22 miles, and it took 2 hours and 49 minutes to complete. The successful flight demonstrated the viability of human-powered flight for long-distance travel, and serves as one of the most fun workouts of all time for the pilot. This achievement wasn't just a testament to the capability of human ingenuity and determination, but also a milestone in human flight. It showcased the potential of lightweight, efficient aircraft designs and highlighted the importance of optimizing aerodynamic efficiency. Plus, it was one of the world's first zero-emission flights, which is kind of cool. The success of the Gossamer Albatross opened up possibilities for further advancement in human-powered flight, inspiring future projects and competitions like the annual Sikorsky Prize, which aimed to encourage the development of human-powered helicopters. Today, it sits on display at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, serving as a reminder of the incredible achievements made in the pursuit of human-powered flight. Its flight across the English Channel remains as a symbol of human determination, innovation, and the enduring spirit of exploration power to the people and to the planes. Moving on to number seven, the C-450 Coleopter. This one, looking like a rejected aircraft from the set of Buck Rogers, the Snecma C-450 Coleopter, often referred to as the Beetle, was a funky-looking experimental aircraft developed by the French aerospace manufacturer Snecma in the 1950s. Its unique design and vertical takeoff and landing capability, it aimed to revolutionize aircraft operations and expand the possibilities of flight. The Coleopter's most distinctive feature was its chunky, cylindrical shape. It resembled a large flying saucer with a circular body and a domed cockpit positioned at the center. The aircraft was equipped with single jet engine mounted vertically in the rear, providing the necessary thrust for that takeoff and landing. It was designed to operate primarily in a vertical orientation. It employed a unique propulsion system. The engine's exhaust gases were directed through small nozzles positioned around the aircraft's periphery, providing that necessary control and stability. The first prototype of it took to the skies in 1956, showcasing its remarkable vertical flight capability. It demonstrated impressive stability and control, and its compact design allowed it to operate in small landing sites such as helipads or clearings. Despite its promising start, the Coleopter project faced challenges that prevented it from progressing beyond the prototype stage. Its complex design and control system required significant technical expertise and precise piloting skill. The limited field of view from the cockpit posed operational challenges, particularly during horizontal flight. Safety concerns also played a role in curtailing the Coleopter's development. In 1959, during a test flight, the aircraft experienced an uncontrolled descent and crashed, resulting in the loss of the prototype and the unfortunate death of the test pilot. While it didn't achieve widespread adoption or operational use, its innovative design and technological advancement left a lasting impact on the aviation industry. The project pushed the boundaries of vertical flight, and it influenced subsequent aircraft designs. Concepts and technologies developed during the Coleopter program paved the way for future advancements in VTOL aircraft, including helicopters and tilt rotors. Number 6. The Lippisch Delta IV The Lippisch Delta IV, designed by German aerospace engineer Alexander Lippisch, was an experimental craft that showcased a unique delta wing configuration. Developed in the 1940s, it aimed to explore the aerodynamic characteristics and performance of delta wing designs. But exploring doesn't always mean a resounding success. The Delta IV featured a distinctive triangular wing shape with a sharp leading edge and a sweep angle of 60 degrees. It had a slender fuselage and a single-seat cockpit positioned near the center of the craft. The wing's high aspect ratio and low drag contributed to its excellent speed and maneuverability. 
One of the key advantages of the Delta IV's Delta Wing configuration was its ability to achieve high speed during a time when aeronautical engineers were testing the limits of flight. The wing design minimized drag and improved stability, enabling the aircraft to fly at supersonic speeds without the need for afterburners. This characteristic made the Delta IV an early precursor to future supersonic craft. It is an astonishing feat considering the Wright Flyer first took to the skies less than 50 years prior. The aircraft's flight controls consisted of elevons, which combined the functions of elevators and ailerons. This control arrangement allowed the pilot to adjust both pitch and roll, providing enhanced maneuverability and control. Everything a good pilot needs during a World War II dogfight. While the Delta IV demonstrated impressive flight characteristics and contributed to the understanding of Delta Wing aerodynamics, it didn't progress beyond the prototype stage. The conclusion of World War II and the ensuing shift in aviation priorities led to the discontinuation of this project. It was a little too late for this thing. Despite its limited impact, the Lippisch Delta IV does remain a significant aircraft in terms of its contribution to the development of Delta Wing craft. The knowledge gained from its design and flight tests influenced similar designs, including the record-breaking Concorde supersonic airliner and the Eurofighter Typhoon. Number 5. Curtis Wright VZ-7 The Curtis Wright VZ-7, also known as the Airgeep, was an experimental aircraft developed in the 1950s by the American aerospace company Curtis Wright Corporation. It was designed to explore the concept of a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, offering increased flexibility and maneuverability, and it also had a distinctive appearance, resembling a bit of a flying saucer. It featured a central cockpit for the pilot surrounded by a circular frame that housed the aircraft's propulsion system. It was powered by two counter-rotating blades mounted horizontally on the top of the vehicle, driven by a turbine engine. One of the key principles of the VZ-7 was to demonstrate the feasibility of a VTOL aircraft and it could operate without the need for a traditional runway. It underwent extensive flight test programs to evaluate its performance and handling characteristics, and while it demonstrated impressive vertical flight capabilities, the project faced several challenges that prevented it from progressing beyond the prototype stage, mainly stability and control caused by the limitations of the necessary technology at the time. Simply put, the VZ-7 was biting a little more off than it could chew, but like so many other old-time flying machines, it provided the necessary insights into what would become modern VTOL aircraft and technology. So, while the airgeep was permanently grounded, its influence can be found in the unmanned aerial vehicles of today. No one ever gets it right on the first try, I guess, and even when they fail, the idea never really seems to dissipate. Number 4. The Westland Hill Pterodactyl the Westland Hill Pterodactyl. It was a British experimental aircraft developed in the 1920s. It was designed by R.J. Mitchell, who would later become famous for his work on the Supermarine Spitfire, one of the most well-known and important military craft of all time. The Pterodactyl was a radical departure from the traditional aircraft designs of the time, featuring a unique tailless configuration, far away from the Wright Flyer of 1903. The pterodactyl had a delta wing shape with swept back leading edges with no tail plane or vertical stabilizer. It was constructed using a wooden framework covered in fabric. It had a single engine mounted at the rear driving a pusher propeller. One of the key advantages of this tailless design was that inherent stability and maneuverability. The absence of a separate tail structure reduced weight and drag, while the swept back wings provided improved aerodynamic performance. The pterodactyl had a good enough low speed handling characteristics, allowing it to fly at slow speeds without stalling. And this plane underwent a series of flight tests before it could hit the assembly line, and its a relatively high maximum speed and good maneuverability made it an intriguing concept for military applications. But intrigue isn't always a surefire thing. Despite its promising flight characteristics, the pterodactyl project faced challenges that prevented it from advancing beyond the prototype stage. Its complex control system and handling characteristics made it difficult to fly and required only the most skilled pilots. Additionally, the tailless design posed challenges for stability and control during certain flight conditions. Basically, the pterodactyl hated the wind. The development was ultimately halted due to the lack of suitable engines and emergence of more conventional aircraft designs that offered comparable performance with simpler control systems. This certainly was an imaginative concept. While the pterodactyl did not achieve widespread operational use, that innovative design and engineering concepts, they contributed to the advancement of aircraft technology. It's another early unique use of the Delta Wing configuration. But because the pterodactyl didn't work out in the end, R.J. Mitchell could go on to help create the Spitfire. Number 3. Handley Page Type F 
Now, there's a certain satisfaction that comes with earning a great nickname. Babe Ruth was the Sultan of SWAT, Kobe Bryant was the Black Mamba, and Wayne Gretzky was simply the Great One. But Handley Page would create the heavy bomber known as the Bloody Paralyzer, Yowzer. On the road to their harrowing bomber, they built the Type F, a two-seat single-engine monoplane designed to compete for a war office prize for a specified military machine in 1912. It crashed before the trials got underway, and although it flew well later on, only one was built. The Type F had a deep rectangular cross-section fuselage, narrowing to the rear with fairings above and below for streamlining. The 70-horsepower Gnome rotary engine was completely enclosed in a snub-nosed cowling. The two crew, they sat side by side as the military specification required, in an open cockpit at mid-wing. The observer, sitting on the left, had a downward view through a windowed hatch. Elsewhere, the aircraft was fabric-covered. The tailplane had a circular leading edge curving a little more than 180 degrees and carried split elevators with scallop trailing edges. There was no fixed fin, only a rudder of irregular six-sided, five of them concave shape, and it had a tail skid formed from a pair of cane hoops. In August 1912, it was taken untested from the factory at Barking to the military trials at Lark Hill. In fact, this would be the last Handley Page aircraft built there. It flew for the first time later that month, handling the windy conditions well, though showing side-to-side -side wallowing that had been experienced with the Type E before its wing-warping lateral control was replaced by ailerons. The next day, the engine failed soon after takeoff, and a wing and the undercarriage was seriously damaged in the resulting crosswind landing. The Type F was withdrawn from the trials and returned to the new factory at Cricklewood for repairs. It was in the air again by November and was flown with enthusiasm with a variety of passengers, but the Type F was lost in December of 1912, when engine failure led to the death of the pilot and passenger. In the retrospective Type redesignation of 1924, the Type F became the HP-6. Number 2. Pescara Richette Helicopter the Pescara Richette helicopter was an early helicopter design created by two French inventors, Raoul Pescara and Louis Charles Bruguet Richette. Developed in 1992, it aimed to achieve vertical flight using compressed air as the driving force for the rotors. This helicopter featured four rotors arranged in a square pattern, with each rotor driven by compressed air generated by a central engine. The rotors were designed to counter-rotate to counteract torque and provide stability. But did it work? Well, the initial flights of this thing showed promising results by 1922 standards. It made it off the ground and hovered for short periods. However, the helicopter faced significant challenges that prevented it from becoming a practical and successful craft. One of those major obstacles was the limited power-to-weight ratio of the compressed air system. This compressed air technology at the time wasn't advanced enough to provide sufficient lift and sustained flight. Its performance was severely hampered by its sheer weight and the low power output of that compressed air. Additionally, the control and stability of this thing proved to be difficult to manage. That complex nature of the quad rotor configuration, along with the lack of advanced control systems, made it challenging. Despite the early promise and innovative design, this helicopter didn't progress beyond the experimental stages. The limitations of the technology and the rudimentary control systems brought development to a halt. But the quad rotor concept inspired future rotorcraft designs, and the challenges encountered with compressed air systems helped pave the way for advancements in those propulsion systems. Number 1. The Avro Car Developed by Avro Canada in the 1950s, the Avro Car was a radical experimental aircraft that aimed to achieve vertical takeoff and landing. But to call it an aircraft really quite doesn't do it justice. The Avro Car looks like a UFO. It was envisioned as a flying saucer-like vehicle that could revolutionize military aviation and change warfare as we know it. However, the Avro car encountered numerous challenges and ultimately failed to live up to those expectations. It was powered by three turbojet engines mounted on the periphery of the disc, providing vertical thrust for takeoff and landing, as well as horizontal propulsion for forward flight. The aircraft utilized the Kawanda effect, which involved channeling airflow over the curved upper surface of the disc to create the lift. Now, despite the Canadian Kawanda design, the Avro car faced significant and blaring technical issues. The airflow patterns around the disc resulted in turbulent air and inefficient lift, leading to poor stability and control. It also suffered from low maximum speed and a limited range. Additionally, the project faced challenges with the development of a suitable propulsion system. The engine struggled to provide enough thrust. 
The program was eventually canceled in the 1960s. This project was deemed impractical for military applications, and further development was deemed unwarranted. Although the Avro car was ultimately a failure, you have to hand it to the teams in Canada. The project provided was still a major stepping stone of VTOL flight, and the complexities involved in designing such an aircraft really did help the future of aviation. I'll see you next time. Thank you to our channel members.